Hello, everyone. Hi, we are back. This is the Small Print Podcast that airs every other week on Monday at 1.30 Central Standard Time. Today, as always, you're joined by myself, Elise, who blogs at Roulette Reader. And Dawn, who blogs at Bang Bang Book Blog. And today we're doing something a little bit different. Um, we're kind of taking a different direction and we wanted to do a Kiss of Deception reread because we are huge fans of the series. Um, we read them a few years ago, have been at Arvid, Arvid? <laughs> avid followers of the series. And the last book in the series comes out this year and we wanted to kind of reread it and freshen our mind because it's a huge series. It's very dense in a good way. And so today we start the first portion of that reread where we will discuss chapters one through 13. And then if you have the them. dates at the end, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe we'll link it because I don't know it off the top of my head. Yeah, we'll have to pull that up on our blogs. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're going to just jump right into things um, with our, we're going to do something different first. We're going to do the unpopular opinions tag. Um, this is a blog tag that we find really fun where basically you just answer a series of questions um, and voice your unpopular opinion. So we'll start with question number one, which is, <coughs> excuse me, name a popular book or series that you didn't like. I'll um, let you go. Okay. So I did not like City of Bones. I did like the Infernal Devices and I read the Infernal Devices first and then because I thought I was being fancy by starting with the prequel. Mm -hmm. And then I went to City of Bones and I found it to be horrible. <laughs> I only got through the first book and a half, but it's just... I'm surprised you made it that far. Yeah, I was listening to it. So okay. I was like, oh, maybe book one is just bad. Sure. And then book started. two, yeah. it, it was just hackneyed and Oof. just all the tropes. And when Clary or when Jace decided that he wanted to date Clary, I was like, I'm done with this. I can't. <laughs> so I also have a Cassandra Clare. I, I have only attempted to really read her Infernal Devices series. And so that's on my list. And then, of course, I have to say Kiara Cass's books. I didn't say that one because I actually liked book one and two. But so, see, I, yes, and, and I agree with you there. But the last two books that I read, The Air and um, what was the last? The One. Yeah. They were just so bad that I think it just ruined the entire. Like, I don't even recommend the series anymore. Oh, no. no. Okay. Yeah, like, <laughs> because I know how it ends, and it's, it's just bad. bad. So, a lot of people yeah. like that. Well, I guess that's the reason for the tag. Yep. Mm -hmm. like for sure. All right, question two. Popular book series that everyone seemed to hate, but you liked. So I'll let you go first. Um, For this one, I have a non-YA answer. Um, That is the Jane Austen Book Club. <laughs> They made a movie of it, so maybe you're familiar with the movie, but on Goodreads, it currently has a 3.04 rating. <laughs> oh, no. And I personally absolutely loved that book. Um, so I have no idea where they were coming from with that one. So that's my answer for that. Uh, mine is Twilight. Oh, but that's right. But in my own defense, so I've only been a YA librarian for three years. And this was my first foray into the genre. And so for me, Twilight is great. But okay. if I would read it now, I probably would like, no. See, Twilight for me, when it came out, I was in high school. And that was the reason that I never wanted to read more YA. Because I thought that it was all vampires yeah, and creepy it romance. It kind of was. At, at the time. time, kind of, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I was not a no-go. I was a no-go on Twilight. Yeah. N n n looking in hindsight, mm -hmm. yeah, Bella's terrible. She's terrible. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> Question three. A love triangle where the main character ended up with the person you did not want to end them up, want yeah. them to end up with, warn about spoilers, or an OTP that you don't like? Okay. So for me, it is Selena and Dorian from Throne of Glass. I did not want her with Kale. I preferred Dorian. Yes. Um, and in book two, sorry if it's a spoiler, you did kind of give a warning. Mm -hmm. um, she is with Kale. Um, and that's not what I wanted. However. Nope. I'm not going to say anymore. That is possibly a spoiler, but we're on book four. Now. No, but everybody is not on book four. That's true. <laughs> well, 
either way, with the Throne of Glass series, don't get too attached to anybody. Yeah, that's true. Um, mine has to be Ginny Weasley and Harry Potter. I, I have do not for... know. Yeah. I do not know the logic behind that. No, I know the logic. I just can't. The logic is that he is married into a family. I and think I, that's yeah, where they you, were with You've that. explained that to me, and, and it makes sense, yeah. but really, though, like, no. Hermione had a family. Um, but she's thinking But it's run. not the Weasleys, though. I mean, I don't know. That, I really can't speak eloquently on that. I just don't like it. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. All right. Next one. Popular genre that you hardly reach for. I said realistic fiction or romance. Yeah, I said romance. Mm hmm I will do realistic fiction now just because I feel like I, sh I can't just be reading no, fantasy yeah. working with teens. I have to for sure <laughs> pick up something else. Romance is definitely, if I see a couple or something lovey on the cover, I'm like, I don't care. Oh, yeah. I mean, I will read contemporary for the teens. I'm not reading romance. No. I can recommend. I, I feel like teens, and we say teens and not bloggers because we do work with teens. We're YA librarians. A teen who likes romance they're just gonna like everything. <laughs> yeah. I know that's a generalization, but we have a teen, and her taste is not that refined, picky. No, she kind of likes everything. Yep, she does. If there's a girl and a boy on the cover, and it's cheesy, she's all for it. So, yep. <laughs> not that everybody's like that, but we were given a box of arcs from a publisher, and one of the <laughs> oh, one of the God. descriptions on the back was that this teen falls in love with her professor, and that was a minor part of the story, but. That right there got her to want to read that series. Was it? it was the, I think it's the goldfish one. Oh, yeah. Or the she, new guy or whatever. Yeah, she didn't like that book oh either. Oh, my God. I know, and she ended up not liking it. It's like, that's why you can't just judge based on these tiny little snippets that you like. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Number five, popular or beloved character that you do not like? Ginny Weasley. <laughs> there you go. I could not stand that girl. <laughs> oh, I, oh, oh, sorry, I let you finish. Yeah, I don't want to say why, because it's mean, okay. but, and I said I was going to stop. Oh, you know, that's right. Slut shamer, but yeah, she's right. a bit of a whole bag. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I just did not feel the chemistry. That is horrible. It's like, no, between Ginny, them. it's like you're saying that Ginny Weasley absolutely must be pure for Harry. No, I'm just saying that the way they made her character, especially in the books, not so much in the movies, her brothers called her a loose girl. The twins like made fun of how many boyfriends she had, and wow. I just I think in the movies they just had no chemistry. I just felt like the two actors, their chemistry was just terrible. Mm -hmm. I would pref I preferred I him with Luna. Mm -hmm. I liked that pairing better, but yeah, mm -hmm. so I don't like Jenny. Yeah, at all. Nope. <laughs> um, I have Kath from Fangirl um, by Rainbow Rowell. Yeah, she's pretty bad too. She. You know, when I first started reading the book, I could kind of see some of myself in her. She's new. She's going to college. Um, she's really shy, who hasn't gone through that experience. I'm a shyer person. I'm a very reserved individual. But at some point, you get over it. You know, and at yeah. some point, you want to make friends. It was like every attempt that people made to be her friend or to invite her somewhere. She was like, ugh, yeah. no. It was like, oh, my. Do and her, you and want people to think you're a star? Your first friend is your roommate. Right. And she was just like, ew, no, get out I of know. Face. It's like, that is your safety net. <laughs> You two are like unspokenly bound yeah. to one another. Yeah, she just drove me insane. Yeah, she wasn't. Good that made me hate the book. Yeah. Okay. Is it my turn? Yep. Popular author you can't get into. Andrew Smith. Okay. I like Andrew Smith. I know. <laughs> and again, he's one of those authors where I understand why he's famous. I understand why his books are popular. He is a cool guy. He he writes well. I just, for some reason, have not been able to stay with any of his books. I wish I could. Maybe someday. <laughs> I picked, I don't know how to say this. Tamara, Tamara Pierce. Tamara Pierce. Yep. I have not read her I books. I have tried. I have not read them. I have not ever picked one up. But I saw her in a webinar, and she had some disparaging remarks about you know Hunger what? Games yes. and Katniss. And that just put a bad taste yep. in my mouth about her as a person. Okay. I, so yes. she just came across a little bitchy. And I'm yep. like, mm, she, I just, I don't want to read her books. Yes. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the history behind Tamara Pierce, she is the mother of the strong female YA protagonist. Okay. And I read an article of hers in the SLJ 
where she said the same, she must have said the same thing. She said, she's like, I wrote Katniss 20 years ago, guys. It was like she was trying to give herself a pat on the back. It's like, yeah, okay, you have been the pinnacle of YA female heroines forever. Give, like, you know, give other people the chance to do it too. I mean, oh my, same thing. It just put a bad taste in my mouth. I did not appreciate that. Yeah. Like, we don't just need one strong female heroine. We need many, you know. Okay. Let's see. A popular book trope that you are tired of seeing. Example, like, lost princess, corrupt ruler, love first. triangle. I said right. love triangle, insta-love, and overly perfect romances. Like, in fantasy, sometimes I feel like they, they feel the need to throw in an insta-love or some kind of romantic element to keep um maybe more surface readers engaged in the story yeah especially with kiss of deception like this that's a good kind of segue i guess later but kiss of deception has this intense history plot culture going on underneath the surface and all the people seem to want to talk about is the supposed love triangle the supposed mm -hmm. romances it's like you're clearly missing the point that's what i'm tired of seeing i actually missed this question in my notes um <laughs> so <laughs> i guess i don't like insta love because that's an instant oh well no that's not a trope that's just a thing i don't like um but yeah i'll go with insta love <laughs> okay. i mean i think pretty much everyone hates insta love yeah. except for teens unfortunately yeah <laughs> some teens hate it but you know um all right a popular series that you really have no interest in reading i said shatter me by tahara mafi i tried twice i tried to read it and then I tried to listen to it, which is even worse because she makes like these little slash noises that got annoying real Ew. quick. Um, I I tried. I keep hearing about this awesome steamy makeout scene on page something or other, but that's not enough <laughs> to get me to read that story. No. So yeah, I'm not. I said she's um, cool though. Yeah, she's a very on cool Instagram. Person. She has she's awesome. The most amazing but, feed. Um, maybe her next book. I'll try yeah. to do that. Yeah, she's a cool person. Mm -hmm. Um, I said Maggie Steve Otter's Shiver series, which was yeah. basically Twilight without the vampires and just werewolves. That mm -hmm. yeah, I, um, and then I also said the rest of John Green's novels. <laughs> 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 I read the Baltimore Stars and I'm just not I'm just so over him. He's the most overrated author. I wouldn't say that. I'm giving him I'm giving overrated. him his claps and Move on. He can move time. on. I Thank personally you. don't think he's overrated. I think he's a really good writer, and I think his books are relatable to a lot of teens. I think it makes them think about themselves and not so small minded. Um, but everything that's going on around them, there's a lot of, you know, boys who read the books that are Pudge and maybe not Gus, but, you know, now the, his little fascination with the pixie girl, that's kind of annoying. Yeah. I get that. But that's I, this type. I, I mean, don't what can you like, say? I don't like the female characters that he tends to write. He yeah. he writes strong male characters, yeah. and that's fine. You know, um, that's needed as well. But I, I'm glad that I read The Fault in Our Stars first because I really like that book. It's a great book for many, many reasons that I won't get into. Um, but, you know, and I love that I cannot think of her name, the heroine in that story, the protagonist. Hazel. Hazel, thank you, sorry. Um, I liked Hazel, but then I tried reading Paper Towns. I tried reading a couple others, and I'm like, oh, no. yeah, I agree. His female characters are not great. They're not that. They're not that strong. They're not great. So, yeah. all yeah. right. And the movie, TV show, better than the book. Again, this is a. I have a non YA one for this. Uh, the Count of Monte Cristo. I got flack on that for this when I wrote that. Somebody commented and was like, "The movie is not the same as the book." I was like, is that how they dude? typed it? That's literally how they typed it. <laughs> like claw hands at the keyboard. It was like, oh my God, dude, this is an unpopular opinions post. Calm down. <laughs> um, so yeah, that has to be my answer. I love that movie so much. It's so vivid and I have like GIFs and pictures in my blog. So <laughs> yeah, um, I chose Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist. I saw the movie at least seven times. And then I just read the book this year. Oh God, that book is terrible. Oh and gosh. maybe it's because I didn't read the book. If I read the book first, I'm like, oh my God, this is so different. Wow. It's, it's basically a different book. It's like their adventure is totally different. Not totally different, but some of the main major elements are not the same. Okay. So 
if you have not seen or read either, I encourage you to watch the movie because it's great. It's a cult classic. I love it. Um, mm -hmm. It's a Good book, movie. not so much. All right. That's the last question and the unpopular opinions tag. If you would like to do it, you can go to either of our blogs, blogs and just search that title and popular opinions and do it yourself. It's a tag started by somebody else. I don't know off the top of my head who started mm -hmm. it, but what was that? What was <laughs> it was that? A chair. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we are now going to go into our Kiss of Deception reread. And we are doing chapters 1 to 13 today. And on February 15th, we are doing chapters 14 to 27. Um, and then every two weeks, it'll be more chapters. If you want to know the full schedule, you could go to either one of our blogs, uh, Bang Bang Book Blog or Roulette Reader dot WordPress. Um, so we wanted to do a reread of this because this is one of my favorite series of all time. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, I think a lot of people sort of missed it. Yeah. There's a lot going on in this book. And even as I reread the first 13 chapters, I missed a lot. Um, so yes. we're just going to go through chapter by chapter and this is, discuss. The reason I love this book is because it reminds me, I, I mean, I really can't even compare it to anything. It's just, there's something in every sentence. There is a clue to yeah. the larger picture in just about every sentence. And now that I'm rereading it, I almost find it overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Like I was trying to go over the last bits of my nose last night and I'm like, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> and this is only first 13 chapters of the first book you know and there's a reason that i can't really remember a lot of what i read in here because it's so much mm -hmm. so i found that just incredible that after reading it again it was like wow so okay so let's start with the opening last testament of godrell godrell is a person uh, when i first read this book i thought it was like a bible or something I was just about to say, I feel testament. like we're in church. <laughs> Let's open to the first testament of Godra, please. <laughs> and what we think, we're still not quite sure, mm -hmm. but we think that Godrel is telling a story to her grandchild, but she's talking about the grandchild's mother. Hopefully yeah. that made sense. Yeah. So she's talking about essentially her daughter. I'm still not quite sure if yeah, Morgan's we are not positive. We're not yeah. positive on that one. She's talking to Morgan mm -hmm. and she's talking about Morgan's mother. Yeah. We don't know if Godrell is Morgan's mother or if... we, we think it's her grandmother because in the second paragraph paragraph Godrell says my own grandmother told me stories to fill me because there was nothing more. So it kind of the fact that she's recalling her own grandmother doing it means that she's a grandmother doing it to her granddaughter, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. That, that's kind of a context clue there, I think, that yeah. gives us some timeline. Yeah. yeah. And if you were one of those people, because I know a lot of people said they just kind of skipped this stuff, the yeah. Morgan text and the Venda, that's like 75% yes. of the story that you just skipped. Yeah. <laughs> so, you should read those guys not in terms of pages but in terms of content yeah like again clues you know um both to where the story is taking place and what is happening yeah this is not just a girl running away from a marriage yeah you know what i mean this is so much more it is okay so let's go to chapter one and this is where we meet leah and she is the first daughter of morrigan and you will get to learn what Morgan is as you keep reading or who Morgan was mm -hmm. um, as you keep reading. And she has a gift. And once again, you will, as you keep reading, you will get more into what her gift is because she doesn't feel like she has it yet. Right. Um, I personally think that she's had it all along. And that's one reason why her mother lost her gift. Because there is a, I think it's in the first chapter or second chapter, there's a scene when um, Leah is like, re it, she was, she would like crawl up into this alcove or something on the, on the ceiling of her castle or wherever she lives and look at the stars. And she said to myself, if I could just touch the stars, then I would know. Oh. And remember her mom was like, no, what my child? And her, like Leah put her hand to her chest and she felt something. Oh, see, I didn't even catch that. That's what we're saying, people. Like, there's <laughs> stuff all through this book. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. where did that power go? If it left her mom, it wasn't just hanging around. It must have gone into her. It's just chilling yeah. in the cafeteria. Just, just <laughs> getting some just snacks. Just hanging out. Okay. So 
Um, I think it mentions that Leah is a Sierra. I'm probably butchering that. Shall you define that? And a Sierra is someone who can basically see into the future. I mean, that's how you kind of, the easiest way to explain it. Mm -hmm. She can see what's going to happen and she can lead people. So she's very important. A Sierra is very, very, very important to this world. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind as you, if this is your first time reading this book through, um, take note of Leah's real name um, and that Leah is her nickname. Her real name is Jezalea. That will come back. Mm -hmm. And she's of the house of Morgan, which I don't know what prompted me to do this, but I Googled Morgan. And apparently it is an old, like old French word that means terror or phantom queen. And neither of us have quite tied that to the overall plot yet, but just keep that in mind as well. Yeah. It's it's mystical. Yes. Um let's see. I have my notes. <laughs> you do have quite Okay, so we learn in chapter one that she is to be married to the Prince of Dalbrick, but she doesn't want to be her father's pawn in this politics. Um, so one can see that as selfish, um, because the whole point of her marrying is to form an alliance, a stronger one, and she's basically dooming everybody by running away because she doesn't want to be married to Prince and be tall wipe it down. So, I mean, that's a weakness that mm -hmm. she has, and hopefully she grows at the end of the book. That's what, what she's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not yet. Nope. All right. Well, she's also insecure. Um, it's not just that she's acting out of selfish impulses. It's that she doesn't really understand the gift that she's supposed to have. And this bargaining chip that they're using, this gift is her bargaining chip and the bargaining chip that her father is using as well. Um, she's convinced she doesn't have it. And so she thinks she's both doing herself a disservice, her family and this new kingdom a disservice. And at some point it's going to fall down on her head. And so she's not just acting. It's, she's thought this through. She's not just making an impulse. Um, you know, then she she remembers back to when her mother lost her power mm -hmm, and how yeah. she so dramatically fell in status and importance. And she's like, I just do not want that for myself. Some argue it's her choice to make. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to talk about the cabal? Yes. Okay. So in the first chapter, there's a lot that's happening in this, like right off the bat in this first chapter. It's a tradition in Morgan culture to have the heraldry or the symbol um, of the country that you're marrying into, like basically burned or cut into your back, kind of like a tattoo, but eventually it scars over and is like a, um, it's just basically a tattoo. So Kava um, is what they call it in this book. K-A-V-A-H, and I googled that word again, and it is the Jewish word for to burn, so I thought that was very interesting how she's sort of starting to pull different cultural influences right into this, this new culture within her book. Um, do you want to say anything else about that? Yeah. I just, it's a beautiful scene. That is one of my favorite scenes. It's gorgeous. Um, it's kind of frightening. I mean, that must have been painful. She doesn't really talk about it though because she's thinking about all this plan you know that she's <laughs> hatching in her mind but i thought it was amazing um yeah okay um there's a little bit more we learned about her she's got three brothers and they are soldiers and she was a soldier at one point but then her father was like no we need to protect you yeah time. and we meet pauline who is her maid Pauline comes back into the story. Mm -hmm. We also meet the chancellor and the scholar who play major parts in the story. Um, all right, and then we, it ends with the Morgan Book of Holy Text, volume three. And this is Morgan, the land of Morgan. This is their Bible, mm -hmm. their history. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, so... Okay, so it's basically saying that there's one generation that has lost all of their information. So there's 20 years of nothing, and we are to find out 
what that 20 years of nothing was. It's probably very important. Somebody probably destroyed it on purpose and mm -hmm. we have to figure out who that was and why. Mm -hmm. And you will learn that as you continue to read the story. Okay. So chapter two is when Leah and Pauline have escaped and they are heading north. <clears throat> away from their kingdom into the forest. Yeah. I had to sit and think on that a little bit. <laughs> um, I still don't know why I marked this page. I was going to be able to figure out why. <laughs> With a hairpin. Yes. A bobby pin. Nice. Um, we learn in this chapter what the importance of the alliance between Dalbrick and Morgan is. And it's basically, they're basically band together to hold back the barbarians who are coming across into their territory. Um, so that's really their own, their only reason for working together. And I think Leah's purpose was to solidify it even more. Mm -hmm. um, well, this is really just about them running away and how they did it. And we, we learn more about their friendship as well. And as they continue to travel, we learn more about the region and the land itself, which seems kind of like a pointless detail in a fantasy world, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll learn pretty soon that Pearson writes everything for a reason, so mm -hmm. it's best to pay attention. Okay, so then we get to chapter three, and then we meet the prince, and it just says the prince. And he's the Prince of Dalbrick, who Leah was supposed to marry, and she ran away. So he's going to find her. Mm -hmm. um, we also, did you, I'm sorry, I blanked out a little bit. He, I, what I loved about this chapter is that it, we realize that, we realize how independent Leah really is, that she asked him, she says, I should like to inspect you before our wedding day. Who says that? <laughs> Leah does. <laughs> I love that. That is so funny. And like, just she knew she needed to see him. It would have, and that, I wonder what would have happened if he had acquiesced. It wouldn't have. We will a, never know. There'd be no book. There would be no book. <laughs> but, you know, that's true. Like, would it yeah. have changed her mind? You know, I don't know. Would she have still run away? Because at the end of the day, she still wouldn't know him. Yeah. So, yeah. That's true. Um, right. Anything else in chapter three? No. Chapter three ends with a new text. We have not yet seen the Song of Venda, but now we get the first little snippet of what that is. Um, and this claims to have the one true history and the one true future. So now we have three texts that are, that are going against each other sometimes. Like as the book progresses, you'll see that one is kind of over-exaggerating certain points. One claims to be the truth. The other has more of a religious overtone, um, and that's definitely something to pay attention to. And we, yeah. we still don't know the, again, still don't know the specific details. Yeah, and we're not sure who or what Venda is right. either. But that is important. Yes. Chapter four. Now we meet the assassin. Um, so yeah, pay attention to the chapter headings. That's important. Mm -hmm. And... Okay, so this is important. He talks about the Komazar, and the Komazar doesn't really come back until book two. He has a very big role in book two. And the basically, the Komazar is telling Caden, I'm sorry, the um, Rafe, no. <laughs> He's telling the assassin to um, kill um, Leah, yeah. to assassinate Leah. Okay, so he's basically saying that um, she is the Sierra, she's important, <laughs> and she needs to die. So his job is to travel to Morgan, find her, and to kill her, and he has no problem doing that. Yes. Okay. I was trying to read this little snippet here. I don't remember reading that. Could make all of our efforts futile. Even worse, the girl is said to be a Sierra. Okay, you said that he knows yeah. that she is. Yeah. How did he find that out? I that's okay. I think he finds it out, and I don't think you know that yet as you're reading the book. No. Is because well, if you read her novella Morgan, you'll know. Um, and it's point five. And I'm surprised you read that. 
Why? You just, you never read those. I know, but. I don't either. I like the series, so I was like, I'm going to yeah, read it. Yeah, true. And I actually bought it, too, anyway. <laughs> Man, I don't buy books. <laughs> wow. Um, I think he's a descendant of. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, but I think you learn. Well, yeah. Further I guess your story. that's a dumb question. They do have their own, like I just said, they do have their own, like, religious text. Okay. Um, oh, this is a short chapter. Yeah, it's very short. I like how he thought it was going to be super easy to bring her back. Mm -hmm. oh, well, it kind of wasn't right. hard. I well, mean, initially, she was found, and all you had to do was, burp, burp. but <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. So okay. now, chapter five, and then it begins with the Morgan Holy Book of Holy Text, volume four. Yeah, so before it was volume three, so it has been rewritten, probably by some nefarious people. Um, and is there anything important in this one? They thought themselves as temple of one God. Um, so from this, I took that the men were thinking they were very important if you thought if you think yourself a step lower than god you consider yourself quite important and i think they became a little too arrogant and a little bit too powerful mm -hmm. and then that is where their troubles started yeah yeah chapter five um pauline and leah make it to terebin and begin to start their new life there essentially yeah it's very picturesque yes. town um, so in this chapter, we meet Birdie, Gwyneth, and Enzo. I think Gwyneth is going to be important. I do too. I think Enzo probably will too. I'm not quite sure how. Yeah, yet. but even by the end of this book, Gwyneth, you you don't really know, but you know that something's up with her. Yeah. Um, I think she's going to be featured in the last book here. Yeah. We meet new cities. Um, a new culture is kind of being introduced as well which I always find fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, so this is where Leah starts to hear voices. Mm -hmm. When she's bathing, she hears, I will find you in the farthest corner. Um, and she thinks that she's just hearing people singing or, but it's, it's her gift. She just doesn't yep. realize her gift is starting to make an appearance, at least right. in her, to her. It's probably already been there, but she just didn't know it. Okay, chapter six. Um, this is Pauline and Leah talking. Um, and then we meet Michael mm -hmm. as Pauline's boyfriend and she's waiting for him to come back to find her. Yeah. Have we, we haven't figured out who this voice is, correct? Not yet. Not even in the second book. I think I know who it is. We talked about this. I do not remember. <laughs> um. Well, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. okay. So, what else happens in this chapter? Is this where she is? Are they working in the? Not quite. Um, no. They're about. They're entering the inn to try to get work. Yeah. And Birdie is like, how? Oh, could you possibly help? Yeah, well, we start to see also in this chapter how headstrong Leah is. She's like, I think this is a chapter where she stood up to the scholars and was like, I'm not going to read this mm -hmm. additional education that you want me to. And she's punished for it. And we learn that the scholars and the chancellor, they don't like her. Yeah, they don't at all. She's a little bit too... Too smart. Yeah. Yep. She's too a curious. big mouth. She's not going to take it anymore. Basically. <laughs> so that's important. Yeah. And chapter, oh no, we have another song of Venda. Yeah. In here. Old men shall dream dreams, young maids will see visions. The beast of the forest will turn away. They will see the child of misery coming and make the clear make clear the path. So, yeah. The song of Venda is like very dark, very ominous. <laughs> Venda's actually quite... It's it's an interesting part yeah. of the story, and it becomes much more interesting as you keep reading. I mm -hmm. won't say anything else, but yeah. yeah. Again, pay attention to this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, chapter seven. We are back to the assassin, and he has found Leah mm -hmm. in Terrapin. The same time as the prince has found Leah, which is chapter eight. Yeah, 
And then we also learned that Enzo has a big mouth. Yep. Huge. Both of the men are beginning to not like her necessarily, but they're they're drawn to some kind of like certain quality about Leah, especially the assassin. He, I think he's just shocked he's that shocked, she's just right. not this pampered princess right. that she's working. Because that was what he was led to believe yeah. by the commissar. He thought I think he he's fascinated in and out. by her. Both of them are. Yeah. I think even the prince is like, oh, yeah. she's in here mopping and mopping dishes. Right. Mopping floors and serving food. And yeah. So the prince saw her bathing in chapter eight. He says a wedding kava. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, from the stable. It's Enzo. Yeah. Yeah. That's what she said. Yeah. Okay, Enzo told him. I was like, he did. Sorry. <laughs> I don't remember that. It's like, wait, no. Okay. Yeah. She's not the most intelligent traveler. Like she left clues along the way, kind of. But yeah. I mean, that's to be expected if you've never done that before. It's not like the scholar and the chancellor were teaching her these things. <laughs> you know, obviously. She tried. Right. She tried to pay them off. Right. But... If they can be paid off once, they can be paid off twice. Right. Well, I thought it was cute that the prince um, starts to believe that the stuff she's doing is personal. That she's like flouting it in his face because she maybe assumes or knows that he's following her. He thinks. Um, he's like, I don't like being played with by a 17-year-old runaway. <laughs> you know, he's kind of a little petty, kind of. I mean, I would be upset too, but she doesn't know you. <laughs> How could it possibly be personal? And then I loved that he um, eventually meets up with the assassin unknowingly. Yeah. And they're like, let's have a drink together. Yeah. It's like, oh, God, fate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Chapter nine, nine is back to Leah. Um, they're now working. So yeah, this is kind the... of just her working. Leah begins to um, observe the townsfolk. Because she's she knows she's still in danger. Mm -hmm. And she knows people are looking for her. And at any moment, you know. Yeah, she's like, I can't hide every time someone walks through the door. She knows people are looking for her, but she's not scared. She's not gonna hide. She's going to start to make a new life. So I thought that was cool. And so now we learn a little bit more about our assassin and our prince. We know the because they're sitting together and we know one is named Caden and one is named Rafe. Um, and we know one of them is a fisherman and one of them is a pelter. But we do not know who is who. Yeah. So we know what, um, wait a minute. Okay. So we know that Caden is blonde and Rafe is a brunette, but we don't know if, what the assassin and the prince look like. Right. So Pearson has strategically left that out. So you don't know who is who. Um, and it's, you have to try and figure it out. Yep. It does get revealed at some point, but up until then, because, um, I mean, Leah doesn't know either. No, she doesn't. Mm -hmm. So we kind of discover along with her. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then at one point she starts to talk to them and she's talking to the fisherman, which is Rafe. And she's like, I, I've never heard his voice before, but then I tell it, she says, but she has. So as the reader, I'm assuming she's hearing the farthest corner, I will find you. So she's, she doesn't quite realize it yet because it's italicized me right. that she doesn't know it, but yeah. the, we, the reader should. So yeah, so we're assuming that it's Rafe that she's listening or that she can hear. Mm -hmm. Um. And she has some conversations with them. Yeah. Which is bold. <laughs> They're trying to get information from her. She's being equally withholding. And yeah, like you said, we, we learn their names. Okay. So chapter 10. Um, in chapter 10, we start to, she like throughout all the chapters, she starts to talk about her father. And we kind of start to learn that her and her father don't get along very well. He doesn't seem to like her very much, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is going to be important as the story progresses. I have a feeling he thinks that her gift is going to fail as well as his wife's did. So he's trying to hurry up and marry her off? I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me use it while I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
then she's meeting Caden and Rafe and they're trying to talk to her a little bit more, which I think they're falling a little bit more and more for her. Mm -hmm. Much to the surprise and chagrin of them both. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for that chapter. Yeah. We she notices see. that Caden is unsettled and really jumpy. Like he sums up. Okay. But she doesn't know what exactly. So now chapter 11 is the assassin. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting how we see Caden and Rafe and then we get the assassin chapter and he's talking about his experience meeting her, but we still don't know who's who. It's very vague. Mm -hmm. It could be either one of them talking. And then the Prince chapter is right after that. And once again, he's relaying what it's his point of view now, mm -hmm. not hers, but we still don't know who is talking. Um, okay. Anything else in those chapters that we need to talk about? Nothing major. Okay. Still kind of the groundwork chapters. Yeah. Okay. So chapter 13, um, they go to Devil's Canyon as a um, an errand mm -hmm. for Birdie. And we get to know a little bit more about, I think, is this where we get to know more about Gwyneth? And Paulina, honestly. Yeah. That's at the end, though. Yeah. Um, but Gwyneth has a, wait a minute, let's go back a little bit. Yeah. So in the beginning of this, well, not the beginning, kind of like in the middle, she's talking about a dream that she's having. And actually, let's go back a little bit more. And this is something that I did not catch the first time I read it at page 100. Um, well, not for you, I don't know what page it is for you. Uh, Pauline is like, do you remember? She's like, do you remember that miscreant soldier that comes in after Caden and Rafe? And Leah's like, no, I was in the kitchen. That miscreant soldier comes back. Mm -hmm. So as you are reading that, keep that in mind. He does come back. Yeah. And I did not catch that the first time I read this book. Okay. So then Leah starts, she has a bad dream, but I think it's visions. I don't think it's a dream. Oh, she's like, Caden and Reef certainly linger. Her oh. name was Rafe. Oh. Like, well, <laughs> Elise I likes have, to find typos yes, and I arcs. <laughs> I have the arc in my hand, so yeah. It's like ancient <laughs> history here, guys. <laughs> uh, so yeah, she starts to, she's talking about these dreams, but they're really visions that she's having. Um, I think it's Rafe she's talking about, but I think it's a little vague. Because she, she says, I favor one over the other. She doesn't say which one, but maybe she does, and I just didn't understand. I don't know. But I think it might be Rafe that she's talking about. So she's seeing him in the deep forest, walls of crumbling ruins, eyes crackling and fan of flames. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what book she sees all this in. Is it in the first book or the second book or maybe the third book? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe all three of them. Not quite sure where she's seeing him. And then... Gwyneth. Oh, so another thing that I noticed um, on the next page is how uh, Leah is describing Caden's horse, and she describes him as a dragon, like he looks like a dragon or in the lineage of a dragon. And I'll come back to that in a second as we keep going, but just keep that in mind. Um, anything else about that? Yeah. yeah. And then I think we meet um we start talking about michael quite a bit in this yeah. chapter i like the story she told about they painted their houses different colors so that the soldiers coming back will know yeah what house to go to and yeah we learned a little bit more about michael mm -hmm. she's sad did we say that he's pauline's like boyfriend i think love. we did yeah yeah okay um and then they go to pick up gwyneth and some little girl comes out and that's all She's just like, bye, Miss Gwyneth, or thank you, Miss Gwyneth. I can't wait to show Mama. We and then that's it. Gwyneth mm -hmm. is very private. She doesn't really talk much. And but we have this mystery girl that's not there by accident. That's gonna come back. I can't remember how, but yeah, I think I remember. But mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, I remember. Okay. <laughs> it's a spoiler, though. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, then the chapter finishes with Pauline getting very sick. 
And she says, Pauline and I both knew it wasn't her morning meal that made her sick. <gasps> bum, bum, dun, dun. Bum. Pauline is PG, as they said on Grease last night. <laughs> You're PG. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yep. She's a with child, people. Okay, so then it ends with the song of Venda again, and then it says, and this is extremely important because this is now yes, it is. theory time. So from the seed of the thief, the dragon will rise, which means somebody's son or daughter of the thief is the dragon. Yep. The dragon is the villain that we or have not it? met yet. Or is it? The gluttonous one feeling feeding on the blood of babes, drinking the tears of mothers. Sounds kind of villainous to me. It does. <laughs> but again, Song of Venda is very dark. And we were talking earlier about how, didn't we mention that they seem to be the one who, is, did you say they were like telling, well, I said earlier, they were telling the one truth. You know, how truthful do we feel like the Song of Venda and their representation actually is? Mm -hmm. Do we know yet? I don't think at this point, no. but you know later on yeah. but yeah the dragon and it's it's odd that two things have been mentioned in this previous chapter comparing his horse to the dragon mm -hmm. and pauline's revelation of her pregnancy and then the, literally the next sentence Ew. is from the seed of the thief like i'm not saying that her baby necessarily is a key in this but i think it is because again there, Why yeah. does Pearson spend so much time in this book, the first half especially, talking about her pregnancy? And is this just an offshoot? No. Knowing this book? No, not at all. And one thing that I like about the series is that it's there are so many theories that you can come up with. So in when your logic, the seed of the thief, well, Pauline didn't necessarily steal. Well, I'm not her? saying it's hers. Yeah, but I mean, but you we could not conclude know. that. That could be a theory that we somebody could have. We don't know anything have. about Michael, though. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, and Pauline that, that's, is innocent. We don't know that. We, we do don't not. know her that's ancestors. That's true. So she could be the seed of the seed. Sure. And then there's Michael. We don't know anything about Michael. He could be a but thief. He, we have no idea what he is. He's already he's already stolen a lot from Pauline in terms of emotional connection and. Oh, sorry. That's right. Can't uh, say anymore mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, we're Sorry, not talk about that. I forget that uh, <laughs> this is not. Anyway, <laughs> Michael's not a good guy. Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. But then we mentioned the horse has been compared to Correct. a dragon. So What's is that about? Caden the seed of a thief? Right. I don't know. Right. I have my own theory. I actually am theorizing that Caden is the dragon. I came up with that after reading book two. Yeah. I could be wrong. I usually am. Um, but that's the fun part. <sighs> you can. Kind of speculate i think you right. thought the comazar was a dragon i think a I lot did. of people thought yeah the that's definitely how we're was a dragon and he believe. still could be we don't know mm -hmm. he could be the dragon yeah and that's why again i need to reread book two as well because there were some things that came up between Caden and the comazar that was a little bit mm -hmm. odd yeah yeah so the first 13 chapters hold a lot of information i think the first 13 chapters of this book holds more information than some of the books i've read yes in the past couple months yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay. There's a lot here. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also some things that we did not mention about the book that um, I don't think it's a spoiler. But okay. if you look at the map, you get clues as to where we are. And I, every time I read a book, I always want to know what the setting is. And I want to know the time period. It's just, I don't know. But it helps you understand the book better. Yeah. And when we read the book, we did not have a map. Right. we read the arc and there was no map and so we kind of had to figure it out along the way and mary pearson does not tell you at all she drops these little clues throughout the text and you are to figure it out and you can figure it out from this point on basically through this map yeah um so if we're in the san Francisco, sea sounds like san francisco um so i think it's safe to say that this is america and also at one point um Leah is looking out her window at the Golgotha Bridge, which is the Golden Great Bridge, mm -hmm. and the bridge is decimated. Yeah. So one can conclude that what time period we're in as well. Mm -hmm. So as you are reading, keep that in mind where they travel. Um, I actually had to tweet Mary because it was bothering me because I wanted to know where Teravin was. We went through so much. Yeah, we we Googled what the, the root word meant and we thought wine, well, she's in um, wine, wine country. country, but she's not. 
it's actually Avila Beach um, in California. And if you Google it and you will, you will see the storefronts are different colors, uh -huh. just like Pauline was talking about the different colors of the homes and businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a Devil's Canyon. So as you're reading and you're trying to track where they're at, she drops little clues as to where they're at and what things look like and landmarks. And so you can kind of follow her as she is. So what are we De looking at? Devil's Canyon, Diablo Canyon. That's a village beach and where is San Francisco? Well, he's just Googling, Google mapping it. And, and of course my <laughs> computer, my computer decided to stop working. Oh, there we go. It's quite a ways away actually. San Francisco's up here. Okay, so it is quite a bit south. It's probably, it's equidistant, but it's almost equidistant between Los Angeles and San Francisco, a little bit closer to LA. Okay. Yeah. There's also Death Valley, though. Do you think she maybe means Death Valley? Because she went north into the Sequoia Forest. I don't know. Weird. Okay, cool. Lots of All right. So if this is a reread for you, I hope that you got something a little bit more out of it. I know we did that we didn't see the first time. This is the first yep. time you're reading the book. I hope you're, you've been set up for an awesome book that you're about to read because it's pretty great. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I have any else. Just join us next time. Yeah. We'll be doing, do we want to tell what chapters? I don't remember what they are off the we top. We are doing chapters 14 to 27 on February 15th okay. at 1.30. And so read those chapters, reread them. Got two weeks, same time, take some notes. Um, if you have any comments, please leave it in the comment section. And we hope to hear from you. Yep. See you on the flip side. Bye.